Welcome again. Right now we're at Acts chapter 27. Paul's word versus God's word. And yes, I know this is talking about Paul sailing to Rome, but there's a wonderful little spiritual gold nugget here. So let's get into this right now. When it was determined that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners to a centurion named Julius of the Augustan brand, embarking in a ship of a Dramitium, which was about to sail to places on the coast of Asia, we put to sea, Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. The next day we touched at Sidon, Sidon. Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him permission to go to his friends and refresh himself. Putting to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed across the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and had come with difficulty opposite Nidus, the wind not allowing us further, we sailed under the lee of Crete, opposite Salmon, with difficulty sailing along as it came to a certain place called Fair Havens, near the city of Lesea. When much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because the fast, that is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, had now already gone by, Paul admonished them and said to them, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. So this here is a key verse. Paul said very plainly here, I perceive that the voyage will be, will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo, but also of our lives. So let's see what will happen. Let's see if what Paul said was actually true. But the centurion gave more heed to the master and to the owner of the ship than those things which were spoken by Paul, because the haven was not suitable to winter in. The majority advised going to sea from there, if by any means they could reach Phoenix and winter there, which is a port of Crete, looking southwest and northwest. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to shore. But before long, a stormy wind beat down from the shore, which is called Euroclidon. When the ship was caught and couldn't face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Clada, we were able, with difficulty, to secure the boat. After they had hoisted it up, they used cables to help reinforce the ship, fearing that they would run aground on the Syrtes sandbars. They lowered the sea anchor, and so were driven along. As we labored exceedingly with the storm, the next day they began to throw things overboard. On the third day, they threw out the ship's tackle with their own hands, when neither sun nor stars shone on us for many days, and no small storm pressed on us. All hope that we would be saved was now taken away. They all thought they would die. When they had been long without food, Paul stood up in the middle of them and said, Sirs, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and have gotten this injury and loss. Now I exhort you to cheer up, for there will be no loss of life. What? No loss of life? He just said in verse 10, there will be loss of life. What's up with that? There will be no loss of life among you. That's a change of the story. But only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel, belonging to the God whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Behold, God has granted you 
all those who sail with you. Therefore, sirs, cheer up, for I believe God that it will be just as it has been spoken to me. But we must run aground on a certain island. Well, so at first he said there will be loss of ship, there will be loss of cargo, and loss of lives. And now he changed the story and he said an angel came to him. So we got two different sources here. The first one in verse 10 is Paul himself. The second one, an angel of God came to him. Let's see what happens. But when the 14th night had come, as we were driven back and forth in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors surmised that they were drawing near to some land. They took soundings and found 20 fathoms. In the notes here, 20 fathoms is about 120 feet, 36.6 meters. After a little while, they took soundings again and found 15 fathoms, which is here, it says, 90 feet or 27.4 meters. Fearing that we would run aground on rocky ground, they let go four anchors from the stern and wished for daylight. As the sailors were trying to flee out of the ship and had lowered the boat into the sea, pretending that they would lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these stay in the ship, you can't be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes from the boat and let it fall off. While the day was coming on, Paul begged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you wait and continue fasting, having taken nothing. Therefore, I beg you to take some food, for this is for your safety, for not a hair will perish from any of your heads. When he had said this and had taken bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of all. Then he broke it and began to eat. Then they all cheered up, and they also took food. In all were about 276 souls on the ship. When they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. When it was day, they didn't recognize the land, but they noticed a certain bay with a beach, and they decided to try to drive the ship onto it. Casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, at the same time untying the rudder ropes Hoisting up the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But coming to a place where the two seas met, they ran the vessel aground. The bow struck and remained immovable, but the stern began to break up by the violence of the waves. The soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim out and escape. But the centurion, desiring to save Paul, stopped them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should throw themselves overboard first to go toward the land and the rest should follow some on planks and some on other things from the ship so they all escaped safely to the land now we've got two different things here we've got two different words here we've got the word of paul when he said everything will be lost including our lives he said the ship the cargo and our lives, okay? He didn't say might. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say, well, there's a chance. He said they will be lost. Lives will be lost. Cargo will be lost and on and on, okay? Then we've got Paul again speaking up, changing the story because guess what? It wasn't his word anymore. He was delivering a word that he got from the Lord through an angel saying the ship will be lost, the cargo will be lost, but the lives will be saved. This is a great lesson in the word of Paul versus the word of God. Okay, most Christians, they read, you know, the letters of Paul, the epistles of Paul. And, you know, in a lot of places, actually in most places, Paul doesn't say, the Lord says this, thus saith the Lord. The, you know, Paul doesn't say an angel, you know, spoke to me and said this, okay? Paul is just writing to other believers, okay? He is writing his own word. Now, does he include the word of God in his letters? Well, yes, he does. 
But not everything that Paul says is the word of God. Now, before you go, listen. The scripture said, you know, before you make a judgment, you better listen to it all. Don't be a fool. That's what it says in the book of Proverbs. Listen to everything before you answer. Okay. Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, what I say right now is not a commandment from the Lord. What I have right now, what I'm saying is not the word of the Lord. It is, by implication, my own word. It's my word. I don't have any word from the Lord concerning this, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And then he admonishes the people. Now, I know there are Christians out there that say that every single word of the New Testament, every single word that Paul wrote is the word of God. You claim to be a Bible believer. You claim to believe every word of that New Testament. But you can't believe every word of that New Testament and say that every word of it is God's word because Paul said, especially in that one instance when he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I don't have a commandment from the Lord. I don't have the word of the Lord concerning this. I'm giving my own opinion here. And so you got to take it all with a grain of salt. It's one thing to have Paul's word versus God's word. But it's another thing to realize that they are opposed to one another. At least in this circumstance, Paul's word was wrong. When the angel of the Lord came to Paul, the angel of the Lord corrected him and said, no, Paul, what you told everybody is not right. Let me tell you the truth. This is the word of the Lord. A lot of Christians read the epistles of Paul, the letters of Paul, as if that Paul is a prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah, where almost everything he says is, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Hey, listen, if it says, thus saith the Lord, then I believe it. Thus saith the Lord. But most of the time, Paul doesn't say that. Okay? Here's a great example. The first time when Paul said, lives will be lost. He said it emphatically. It will be that lives will be lost. That was the word of Paul. Later on, he said, oh, wait a second. I really got a word of the Lord now. An angel spoke to me, and this is what the angel said. That's the word of the Lord. Paul was proven wrong. So when you read the epistles of Paul, what a better time to start talking about this than just a one chapter before we get into all the letters of Paul. But before you read the letters of Paul, you need to take it all with a grain of salt. You're not reading the words in red. You are reading the words of Paul. Does Paul have the word of God in his letters? Well, yeah, there are some places that he actually quotes, you know, the scriptures, the word of God in his letters. Yes, he does. But not everything that Paul says is the word of God. Does that mean that everything that he says is wrong? No. Even if it's not the word of God, it might still be true. It might still be true. Okay. Might be false too but it might still be true. Don't get me wrong. When I say there's something in the Bible that's not the word for word, word of God, I'm not saying it's false. I'm just saying it's not the word of the Lord. It might still be true. It's just not the word of the Lord. And Acts chapter 27 is a good example of that. Seek God with all your heart and you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.